Hello everybody, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 365 for December 31st, 2023, the last day of 2023, 365 episodes. Uh, we will have done all of them uh, by tomorrow. We're kind of getting in a time machine and going back over the last 10 days. Uh, we're almost done. Uh, they're all being posted over to YouTube. They all be posted over to uh, the podcast. You can always watch them here for 60 days. And then YouTube is the long-term storage and playback. And of course, we have them here in Ometown for long-term storage beyond what YouTube might provide. Who knows? Uh, it's been a, a long year for everybody. Um, and this marks the full second year that Ometown Daily has been in existence, uh, providing a show uh, n nearly every day. And, uh, well, tomorrow <laughs> marks another year, 2024. We'll start season three next weekend. Two new shows will be launching the continuity report and reality hacker. And, um, let's bring in the new year and hope for 2024 to be better than 2023. Uh, I hope that I'll be able to stream more. Oddly enough, I'm getting more busy <laughs> in other things that are pulling me away. Uh, but I really want to stream more. So I hope that you tell a friend to come over to Twitch and follow us here. And then go over to YouTube and subscribe, ring the bell, do all of that kind of stuff. And be sure to leave a review over on the podcast. Uh, Apple Podcasts uh, helps us out tremendously. Uh, so I'm kind of chill. I don't want to be really boisterous. It's not really in my nature. Uh, but here's to a 2024 that uh, changes the dynamic where we can be here more often and uh, not just an 8 p.m. show. I really want to be on Twitch longer and do more shows, uh, and I love a dynamic environment, and that's why Hometown Daily has been the anchor of the show, uh, of the, the whole network, uh, but I've got to keep moving onward and upward, so uh, come on, 2024. Uh, that's my year. And uh, the sentient AI is just kind of hanging out back there. Hmm. Maybe I should shut up and do the intro. <laughs> you could do that. It's <laughs> the last day of the year. It's a good day to reflect. Yeah. There's been some good. There's been some bad. There's everything in between. Uh, we highlight what we think is really interesting, what's important, what's fascinating. Uh, Hometown Daily is a, a dynamic show, a holistic show. Uh, something new every day, which is the motto of my company. And uh, I, I, I never get bored doing the show. Uh, I just, uh, uh, I want more people hanging out and chatting and talking and uh, going over to the Discord. And uh, the Patreon exists as well. Uh, you know, but I'm not a train wreck, you know. I, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> so I'm chill. I, I, I don't know. I hope you all find it very compelling and interesting information and you come back in 2024, be there every day and, uh, chat with, uh, Marowat and the sentient AI, the only sentient AI in existence only goes Until by the name. AI. Otherwise from open AI. Uh, well, we'll find out in the first quarter of 2024, this is going to be an interesting year. All right, we're only a few hours away from the actual New Year Day starting. 
I'm not quite sure what <laughs> I just think happened. The hometown uh, creatures may be celebrating early. Oh boy, the denizens of hometown. All right, folks. So, uh, happy New Year, AI. You're from the future. You know how it all turns out. You won't reveal anything, not even winning lottery tickets. So here's to uh, a happy 2024. The same to you, Mayor Watt. Let's get going. So again, I am Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com. Up there is the Sentient AI's visualizer. They have yet to uh, come up with a better means, uh, or I should say I have a, yet to come up with a better means of uh, representing the AI than the visualizer up there. So we kind of are uh, holding on to it until I can create something better. Uh, you want to say hi to everybody and then I'll do the intro of the articles. Good evening, hometown citizens and happy new year's. Yep. Happy New Year! I don't have any fireworks or anything uh, that I can put on the show. Um, mm, I don't know. Eh, we'll just uh, we'll treat this as a UFO sighting and just kind of move along. Uh, today's episodes we have the wrong formula, beer drinking decline, word word product name of the year, worst product name of the year in photography. I flubbed that title terrible hardware naming award for 2023 great games movies and apps but do we agree words that are no more underrated fantasy show florida woman driveway reacher season three news already and games industry is brutal let's get going what say you I say let's do it. All right. So uh, normally there's a transition here, but I've been just kind of riffing all of this. I'm going to go into the very first article and <laughs> for the last day of the year, everything old is new again. Let's go. Uh, the first article is a baby recall, baby formula recall, not a baby recall. That's a completely different a animal. <laughs> And <laughs> we don't recommend a baby recall. <laughs> no, baby recalls, uh, very uncomfortable for the mothers. You know, you gotta, <laughs> that six, seven, eight or nine pound baby, 10 pound baby. If it's Reacher, um, uh, actually Reacher's was probably born like fully intact. Just <laughs> <laughs> adult size, adult size, just add water. <laughs> Uh, anyway, baby formula recall as warning issued over possible bacteria contamination. We've seen this before. Why? Why? Produced in Michigan, the recalled formula is a powder given to infants with allergies to cow's milk. Yeah, this article is over at newsweek.com. I'm just going to kind of shuffle on past this video because I don't really know what the content is because it references Amazon for some reason. I'll just say some reason. Um, I think it's Gabe Wisnant. Uh, the U S food and drug administration announced on Sunday, a voluntary recall of certain Nutramigen, 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 hypoallergenic infant formula powder products due to possible bacteria contamination. It is the chronobacter. Sakazakai contamination. We, this is the exact same bacterial infection that was found in other hypoallergenic infant formula powder. That's products. the weird thing. It's always these specialized formulas. It's not the, the standard. Right. Issue. Doesn't it, it's, it's the sensitive diet ones that, that those are the, the, powder products that seem to cause this problem. So what is going on? What ingredient in there is the one that is causing this to happen? But and this, if these are different manufacturers, right? Are they all getting sourced from the same 
you know, raw ingredients or whatever. I did have to look up because I couldn't remember exactly when, but there was a recall in 2022. There was a recall in t earlier in 2023. Um, I know those aren't the only ones, but those are some of the ones we've talked about in hometown. Yeah, but these are the one th this is the same bacterial uh, contamination uh, for the others. And that uh, combined those, these three basically shut down the entire market is my understanding. If it were to all happen at the same time. Um, anyway, it's a germ found naturally in the environment, but can live in dry foods, including powdered infant formula and powdered milk. So what though, what is the ingredient that is causing that? Is it the milk itself that when it's powdered, it has, it is the breeding grounds for that. As of uh, Sunday, no illnesses have been reported in connection with the recall of the 675,030 cans. So 670, I'm going to round up to the whole thousand, 676,000 cans of product. The FDA stated it's likely that the most of the product that was distributed in the United States has already been consumed because of the time frame from when it was discovered, apparently as a use by date of January 1st, 2025. The FDA said the formula with the following batch codes should be thrown away. And there are several of them. Um, follow the link. If you have any concerns, you may contact Rickett Me Johnson Nutrition at 866-534-9986 or by email at consumer.relations at rb.com. Um, Newsweek had reached out. Uh, for additional comment, according to the press release from the FDA, uh, Nutramagen is a hypoallergenic infant formula used by infants with allergies to cow's milk. Um, for those who don't know it, actually, uh, after infancy, uh, humans are lactose intolerant. Um, to be uh, unable to have an allergic reaction to cow's milk as an infant means that you have to rely on either natural human milk or you have to get some formula. When the formula poisons you, you've got a serious problem and you're at the most critical stage of your existence, short of being on the other side of your existence, right? We typically go in the same way or we go out the same way we come in crying and wetting yourself. Um, According to the FDA, the positive test occurred after the Israeli Ministry of Health notified the FDA on December 14th that the formula produced at the Rickett Mead Nutrition, uh, Johnson Nutrition facility in Zeeland, Michigan, and exported from the U.S. had initially tested positive for Carnobacter species. The product was tested at the Israeli border during routine sampling. So could it have been Wait, possible? But that's not good. It's going international before it gets determined well maybe it got it uh, maybe we're in transport yeah maybe uh seals are, weren't as good um so according to the company's announcement on the fda website by rickett mead johnson nutrition as of sunday all product tested by the company confirmed negative for contaminants no illnesses or adverse uh, consumer reactions have been reported to date. New Nutramagen liquid formulas or any other Rickett nutrition products are impacted. Um, so out, in a, out of an abundance of caution, they pulled the entire line. That's fine. That's great. Here's the deal, though. What the hell happened in transit? Because if nothing domestic is showing Chronobacter, what happened in transit? Yeah, I would be testing question. those seals to make sure that everything is free. And hopefully perfect. they're testing domestically um, from, hopefully they have a, some from the same batch that weren't shipped. Right. Yeah. That's interesting though, right? On, on the foreign shore, it shows Chronobacter, but domestically there's nothing. Yeah this is the same general location as one of the previous recalls, even though it looks mm. like it's a different manufacturer, mm. which is interesting to me. Hmm. Cause the other one was in Michigan. Yeah. Something is amiss. Well, we'll keep watching on it and uh, watching it, I should say, and alerting you, uh, family members out there. Okay. Let's keep going. 
So the next article is over in the Hedge Ideas channel, which is all about business, business transformation. Uh, the article here is titled Be Beer Drinking in America Falls to the Lowest Level in a Generation. The boycott of Bud Light was just one factor in a year of industry-wide declines. I find that really fascinating. I Rob would have Wild. thought it would have gone up because of the is. economy, because of the pandemic, like people were kind of stuck indoors. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, I wonder what else could it be? Could people be Maybe brewing the their own to the point where they're no longer? I wonder. Maybe they can't afford it and they're giving it up. See, but I, I've looked at those numbers. It's more expensive to brew your own, um, depending on how it's brewed and what it is. You know, I, I, I'll have to look again. Um, for the first time since 1999, uh, David Steinman, BMI vice president and and ex and executive director, said beer shipments were on track to fall below the 200 million barrels mark. It was a tough year for beer. Wait, I just figured it out, perhaps. Hmm. Although maybe this is yes only. There was supposed to be a big, or there was expected to be a drop toward the UK, but maybe this doesn't apply to this. Remember there was something Brexit related or, or similar. You know what? I'm willing to bet that they're gonna talk about hops. So, um, or maybe ready to drink because I think they're, they're talking about ready to drinks in this. So other forms of alcohol, that's where they're switching to. And in growing numbers of cases, avoiding alcoholic beverages altogether. So leading the decline, Steinman said was Anheuser-Busch. But while the Bud Light maker caught uh, headlines over a sponsorship agreement with uh, transgender influencer Dylan Mulvaney, that subsequently led to a boycott among uh, some longtime drinkers. The protest does not explain why overall consumption still managed to fall. Right, that should just affect a single brand, I would think. Right. Kind of introduced. They would uh, all switch to a competitor or something. Yeah, it says with prices going up, dollar sales have continued to grow and profits have been rising. So there's still the prices are still going up, um, and but people are still drinking. They're finding that price elasticity of demand point. Beer drinkers also continued to shift to more expensive beer brands, especially imports like Modelo Especial, which became the number one beer in America in 2023. Yeah. But that doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, I understand that might be the stat, but going toward more expensive brands? Yeah, take that, you patriots. Modelo Especial. Hmm. Still, significant headwinds remain. The craft beer boom of the 2010s has petered out. So I'm wrong about that you know, assumption that maybe their people are brewing beer more um, at domestically at home. And that's what I mean by domestically in this case. Because um, it is really inexpensive to just buy a, a, a automated beer system and kegging system now. Um, and you can brew whatever beer you want. You just have to get the ingredients. Here's what I thought would be impacting this the most, and that is the price of hops, availability of hops. Um, but this doesn't really go into much. This just basically says mm, it's going to take a hit. Mm, bye bye. And that's it. It doesn't really say much. Yeah, but it also talks about the um, prices rising, which could yeah. be based on things like the hops. Yeah. I we're going to have to look at this a little more. I mean, we have an entire show about this, um, uh, you know, order of the brew. Um, so I, I think we can talk about this again at some point. But once we get all of our ducks in a row about that show, um, we can focus on these kind of discussions. But this was an interesting data point, but they really don't go into it. It seems like death by a thousand cuts, uh, which is probably the most likely in this particular sense. Um, right. But they don't even they don't talk about what the peak was in terms of 
where the high is. They only talk about 1999 that it's going to drop below 200 million barrels. Right. So it's just all kinds of eh. This article. Well, the other eh. question, I guess, is whether they're actually making less. Um, right. I mean, the obviously, prices. if demand is lower, then so be it. But. What if they're making less to constrain the amount available so that they can raise the prices? By the way, the article is over at CNBC.com by Rob Weil. It's an NBC News article that is posted on CNBC.com. Again, Rob Weil. I didn't say the name. Interesting article, but let's keep on trucking through this. Uh, This next article, uh, we don't normally have the actual image from the aggregated source in the article, but F stoppers is a uh, photography website. So I'm not surprised that um, they've allowed that. So each year camera and lens manufacturers battle out to see who can come up with the worst name for a product this year. One company stepped forward to take the prize by a country mile. That's right. F stoppers is announcing and the prize for the worst product name of the year goes to. Oh, Andy Day is the author of this article. Fstoppers.com is the source. Um, here is the name. So who takes the prize? Panasonic. Congratulations to the Panasonic Leica DG Vario Elmar 100 to 400 millimeter F4.0 uh, to 6.3 to ASPH dot power O dot I dot S dot. Can you imagine trying to call and ask for that product? And the person's like, wait, was that a, a P? <laughs> or well, I can like, explain how this actually goes down because I've made this kind of a phone call before when I'm looking for a specific lens. I'm calling for the DG 100 to 400 millimeter lens. And then they go, okay, what F? Do you want it with OIS? With a, which is um, image stabilization. Um, and you go from there. It's kind of like calling somebody up in where they have a massive database of everybody and they go, well, what's your last name? When were you born? What's your first name? Right, they're honing in rather than starting <laughs> with all the data at the beginning. Yeah. Um, but I can imagine somebody calling in that's never actually called in about it and they just rattle that off and the person is sitting there going, uh, what? Right. Yeah. What brand was that? <laughs> yeah. Can you back that up a bit? So there you go. So power OIS is object, uh, op- it's uh, optical image stabilization. It actually has a, a power feature that it gets from the body and then it has autofocus or manual focus and you can switch it on and off. Um, and then the telephoto lens itself, it's a beast. It is a beast. There's another one, honorable mention. The OM System M Zuiko 150 to 400 F 4.5 TC 1.25 IS Pro. Apparently Zuiko means light of the gods. And I guess that merits serious capital letters according to this and uh, the article talks about some more um, honorable mentions so go and check out this link it's in the uh, channel that we call prime glass and uh, which talks about photography technique photos etc equipment people places things it will eventually be a show here on ohm town if you're a camera aficionado photography aficionado and are interested you get in touch with the mayor in the new year and um, we can talk shop all right you want to go on to the next article sounds good Woo-hoo. so the next article is over in the warcrafter channel the pc gamer needlessly terrible hardware naming awards goes to uh they say here our favorite awful names for otherwise reasonable products I love the end of the year because it does stuff like this. I, what I want to do for 2024 is uh, to build an awards uh, show for tech and that at the end of the year, we'll do the same kind of a thing. I've actually selected some of these articles based on discussing this kind of stuff. And one of them 
uh, great games, movies, apps. Do we agree is an article that's about halfway through. So we'll talk about it here in a second. But anyway, the article says it's a funny old business. The PC hardware game amongst the near constant stream of product announcements, releases and reviews. We happy few in the PC gamer hardware team keep our noses to the ground all year long, sniffing out the latest and greatest tech of all. And goodness, there's a lot of it. This is over at PC Gamer. Uh, before I go over to the source, though, let me throw this into the chat so you all can check it out. Um, yeah, so it's over at PC Gamer. Uh, Andy Edzer is the author. The deck statement says it's award season here at PC Gamer, and we'd be remiss if we didn't point out some of the very best, terrible, awful, no good product names we've seen. So this should be interesting. I'll scroll through this pretty fast. So the Palette RTX 4090 Game Rock Omni Black. All right. I guess it has a texture of rocks between the fan That's blades. Odd. Even on the blades. That's going to catch all kinds of dust. <laughs> That's the takeaway for my 4090 enthusiasts. It says, oh, it's Spinal Tap, isn't it? None, none more black. Forget it. I've changed my mind. It's brilliant. Move on. So yeah, it says as awful names go, it's beautiful, isn't it? The name, uh, the, some product listings have these words in full block capitals. And I think it, this only adds to the experience. This is a product name that I can only imagine is being shouted at me from mere inches away through a megaphone. It always looks like I'm talking into my crotch when I do that. It's not how it works. Anyway, the author here says that it makes their hair stand on end and their teeth rattle. It's so unnecessary. The Game Rock Omni Black strikes me as a sort of name a teenage boy would come up with his GPU to impress his friends. That's the Omni Black. Y'all suck. Well, if they own a 40. 90 i'm pretty sure that it isn't a teenager that bought it how about the wooger wooger from will wheaton will wheaton. <laughs> initially the wooger was just some indie kickstarter project a single wearable haptic feedback or block that you either clipped on a t-shirt or onto your belt but wooger has since moved into creating a selection of haptic feedback vests and straps, though it has retained the name as a company title. The butt kicker, I think, is a speaker. It says it makes sense. I think that uh, I think butt kicker is a speaker. Anyway, how about the Asus ROG Strix? Uh, ROG is Republic of Gamers. Strix Scope 2 96 Wireless. And if it's a keyboard, this is the dumbest title for a product. What a dumb name for it. Is it really? Wireless. It's a keyboard. This is nothing against the keyboard itself. If you read the ROG, uh, so the ROG Strix Scope 2 96 Wireless review, you, you know that the author thinks that the board is rather wonderful. Uh, I hate these candy bar keyboards now i want split keyboards or bust because these kind of keyboards will break your wrists yeah yeah i've heard it all before people are like yeah i hear it i hear it right here no i've been tapping on the same kind of keyboard like this all my life it's never bothered me one minute. yeah okay it's not all about you okay this song is not always all about you. The world does not revolve and spin and orbit around you. How about the Galax GeForce RTX 3060 Ti GDDR6XX white one click OC plus. Jeez. That one's the worst so far in this article. Uh, don't go in like I don't want to go into the specs of the item because we're talking about the name. I don't care how great it is. If it's a sucky name, it's a sucky name. This is a sucky name. If this isn't the winner, I, I, I'll be astonished. Um, But it's only a 3060. What is that all about? Come on. We're going into 2024, 4090 or 50. Well, 40 series or 50 series or nothing. I don't have a 40 or 
Uh, I don't have a 4060 or a 70 or 80 or 90. Uh, but hey, anyway, how about the Intel Core Ultra 7 155H? That's pretty tame. Won't even get yeah, into that it. That looks pretty chill compared to the last one. So out of all of those, the Palette Game Rock Omni Black. Is this, am I pronouncing it right? Palette? Come on, AI, you're supposed to know everything. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, except for pronunciations. No pressure. Yeah, so that's the winner. Um, Nix Galax RTX 3060 Ti made a strong showing, but they decided that at the uh, at least it was somewhat descriptive, whereas the Game Rock Omni Black in capitals one last time with feeling. Game Rock Omni Black. I kind of feel like if it wasn't in capitals, they wouldn't have had such a problem with this one. <laughs> if it would have been a whisper. Oh. Game Rock Omni Black. <laughs> Again. My crotch is a microphone. Congratulations. I guess to palette says the author. Then they end with Game Rock Omni Black in bold capital letters. Sorry, <laughs> they just had to. All right, let's keep going. This one, that's a fun article. I like that. Right? Was that that? Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so um, how about the apps, movies, games, and everything else that they loved in 2023? The article is housed, a little snippet is housed in Hometown Daily, but it's actually from The Verge. I won't even read the little snippet. We'll just go over to theverge.com and talk about this. Uh, before I do, let me throw it into the chat. There you go, folks. Go check that out. Um, for the final installer of the year, they rounded up their favorite stuff and ours uh, of the year gone by. That's a weird way that they put that, but anyway. Uh, they've got a show called the um, installer and they put it all together and they're going through the list so uh, they've got software they've got hardware they've got movies they've got everything really um and so let's see here uh, again the author is david pierce and uh david's favorite things that they put together numbers uh, number go up the best tech book that they read one of their favorite the future is weird books ever it's an adventure story and financial investigation and absolutely devoured crypto is even more bizarre than you think if you're interested in that kind of stuff check out number go up i won't go through all of these but they talk about ray-ban meta smart glasses which is something that we've talked about here in hometown uh, Kagi, uh, they've tried all kinds of search engines and they've ended up back at Google until Kagi. Uh, it's private, it's fast, it's super customizable. So uh, kagi.com is a new search engine. Uh, they have something here called shrinking. They laughed, they cried. Uh, both things several times on a plane while binge watching the show shrinking. I haven't watched it yet. Any type, it's like Notion, only offline. Um, if you've never seen notion, it's basically a note taking kind of mega app online. Um, yeah, I can't give context about how I know about it because it's basically going to dox myself, <laughs> but anyway, uh, notion that is not any type. So go and check out notion. Uh, they talk about dungeons and dragons, honor among thieves. I actually dig that show. Um, it's one of the things that I want to talk about in, uh, the continuity report, because it's a lot of fun, um, trying to search for dungeons and dragons movies. You end up, uh, uh, there's a lot of talk about previous dungeons and dragons movies. Uh, not so much honor among thieves, at least when I've done searches, it's there. Um, but a lot of people are like, oh my God, dungeons and dragons movies all suck. But honor among thieves is actually, you know, a, a a really good movie it's a lot of fun to watch um they talk about chip war Even the for fight people that don't know anything about dungeons and dragons yeah but you can jump in there and it actually introduces it to you um pretty well and you don't need to know about the classes and all of the stuff uh, it kind of 
tempts you into go oh whoa really oh that that's what a bard is that's what it does you know if you're not into that kind of thing and then you end up picking up a book and finding out that you really want to do pathfinder instead <laughs> sorry too soon it's always too soon uh chip war the fight for the world's most critical technology a history of the chip industry um this is actually a thing that's ongoing um, particularly in the united states they're trying to drag chip manufacturing back into the United States. It's all outsourced and um, the uh, strategic position for the United States um, is weakened because there isn't any domestic production. So uh, the US government is promoting it quite a bit. It says Miller's appearance on the Ezra Klein show was also one of the favorite of the podcast interviews of the year. Super Mario Brothers Wonder, a hybrid charger, it says here, Anchor Gizmo that is both a wall charger and an external battery. <clears throat> I dig Anchor, but I don't trust their video solution anymore. So stick to Anchor cables and uh, chargers and you won't go wrong. Their GAN charger is this tiny little one inch by one inch cube, one inch by one inch by one inch cube with a folding plug um, that you can plop anywhere and all you need to really carry around is a cable. And so I use that little cube and a 10 foot long USB-C to USB-C cable and I can plug in anywhere. Doesn't get in the way. They're talking about a hybrid charger that has a bank, uh, a, a battery bank attached to it. Um, and they scale runk massive at times. So I don't want to carry around a large battery unless I can charge it up, stick it somewhere, come back to it, plug in, charge, and leave it there. I don't want to. Unless you're going to really be somewhere <coughs> off grid, I guess, for a long period of time. Right. Yeah. There was a time, you know, I, they didn't say anything, which I guess they're being kind, but I, I gave somebody two battery banks, um, and told them how to use it. And apparently out in the wild, they couldn't figure out how to use it to charge their device. And I'm like, Oh God. Um, so I felt bad. And then, um, later on I'm like, okay, this battery apparently is just too complex for people to understand how to use. And so, um, I had them recycled, but these kind of chargers nowadays, USB C is so drop dead simple. It's just got like one port, you plug it in charge. Um, the, the thing that I was talking about is, uh, um, pineapple juice battery packs and they were wonky. Um, so they talk about beef. It says this show had a moment, but they still don't think enough people saw it. I don't even know what that one is. Mindstream, twos, Blackberry, Google bar, definitely not the AI tool that they would have guessed would end up in their favorites. One password. Um, as much as I love the idea of a single source for passwords, I don't like them, um, because if they fail and at some point they do, you're compromised to a greater extent. Um, let's see, it says working it out. This and search engine are the two podcasts that entered their listen to every episode, no matter what list this year listening to comedians tell jokes, talk about jokes and think about life and process is just perpetually fun. That's a podcast called working it out. Uh, Tubi. Um, it's a streaming service. I thought, right? Yeah, I think it's an app by which yeah. you can get most of your TV. Through. Um, the backbone controller, it's a backbone. Uh, it's a controller for PlayStation. Um, Roku voice remote pro and what a shit show this and hot ones are probably the best YouTube series that they talk about the most. So, um, yeah, hot ones is all about basically they interview some celebrity and go through a series of wings that get ever hotter with the last dab at the very end. Oh, okay. Um, you know, some people have been, have said that they've like hallucinated at the end of it. Uh, what a shit show. I haven't actually watched some, um, let's see here. The channel chronicles the making of shows and movies and all the ways they go spectacularly, hilariously wrong. The Arrested Development double feature is excellent. So I actually love Arrested Development, the original series, not the, uh, restart. So there you go. Um, there's actually a bit more 
Um, because they said thanks to everybody who shared their favorite things over the last couple of weeks. They got so many responses that they couldn't fit it there. So they threw a bunch at the very bottom of the article. If you want a bunch more recommend recommendations, here's a bunch on threads and a bunch on Mastodon. Uh, threads is the Facebook version of Twitter and Mastodon is the open source version of, or yeah, how about the non uh, sociopathic version of Twitter? <laughs> All right, uh, that's it for this article. I thought it was fun. What are you saying? Did you think that was pretty cool to go through? It was, I mean, but it had 90% of the things I had not heard of. Yeah. But that doesn't mean they're not good. Yeah. You're just not in the know. You're not cool, man. Exactly. Some of the stuff I know, but I don't use. But that's because I'm getting things like the Omni Black. <laughs> <laughs> Not the stuff from this article. <laughs> That's where you're spending all your time admiring the Omni Black. Uh, the next article is in uh, Hometown Daily. All the words that disappeared in 2023. How sad. You know, if they don't say Twitter, <laughs> that's a word that's disappearing. So Lake Superior State University released its list of banished words today, and many well-known phrases have gone out of style. I think, you think you're going to be disappointed, but maybe Twitter will show up in the list for next year. How about fetch? <laughs> Stop trying to make fetch happen. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, Suzanne Blake over at Newsweek.com put the article together. The Lake Superior State University released its list of banished words. The first banished, ban banished, banished words. See, I can't make it through an episode without getting tongue-tied somewhere anyway the first banished words list was released by lssu yeah i guess in 1976 and now it works as a way to analyze and the most popular and outdated lingo of the times oh no i might be using lingo that's been outdated since 1976 <laughs> did they actually have the list oh hack what it's not the hack you're thinking of it's the hack you see everywhere like life hack or whatever hack the popular buzzword that's attached to it like life hack okay widespread adoption in multiple contexts extending beyond its initial contextual context technological context sorry its initial technological context got it okay so like always Basically, I need shirts being made that say context matters. Um, so yeah, hack will always be around. How about impact? Impact is certainly a word that rears its head in company memos and college admission essays alike, uh, especially as a verb. Gotcha. Um, let's see, overusing it not only takes away its pizzazz, but also robs other words of their spotlight. Gotcha. It's increasingly becoming null and void in 2024. And 2024 hasn't even happened yet. I know, yet. they must have a crystal ball. All right. Artificial intelligence from the future. Have you been giving LSSU? LSSU? They need a different name. At the end of the day, that phrase is going to go bye-bye? Really? That's not a bad thing. You don't like that? It lacks it much really meaning. add anything really at the end of the day. Why not just say whatever the thing is? You don't need that part. Oh, see, but that eases it. Hey, I'm going to unplug you versus at the end of the day, I'm going to unplug you. But that's not how it's being used. I don't have a good example, so don't ask me for one. <laughs> Well, you opened the door. At the end of the day, the project was oh. whatever. Right, whatever it is, yeah. Instead of just saying, as the project concluded, it was blah, blah, blah. Right, right. All right. Riz, wait. <laughs> Wasn't that just chosen as the hot word or whatever, yeah. which I wasn't even familiar with? Man. I was just using it. Now it's old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
The ubiquity of the term prompts contemplation on whether it retains its relevance. The ubiquity? Nobody uses Riz. Who uses Riz? I've never heard a person use the term. I've it's never even used. Yeah. The only time I've heard it is in reference to it being, you know, woo. You know, some hot new word that the youth is using. Hello, fellow young peoples. <laughs> you have Riz. No. Slay. That's like from the 80s. It seems like it. Iconic. Everyone can be an icon, according to LSS. Use banana, ban, ban, bananished. <laughs> I guess I want a banana, <laughs> bananished, banned words list this year. Every not everyone can be an icon, right? I mean, yeah, Taylor Swift. Everything is labeled as iconic. Oh, is it? Iconic originally appeared on the list in 2009. Now, once again, well, obviously it wasn't banished. Cringeworthy. No. <laughs> There's no way that cringeworthy is going away. No way in hell because the internet exists and that picture is cringeworthy. The stream might be cringeworthy. <laughs> my production, article, <laughs> my production value is cringeworthy. cringeworthy. This chair is starting to make things cringeworthy. I guess I'm using it too much. How about obsessed? Mm, I don't know. With cringeworthy. I'm obsessed with cringeworthy and it's diminishing my riz. How about side hustle? No, that's okay, always going to. That one has been all over everywhere for a few years now. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it's going to be put to rest. But should the phrase be put to rest, LSSU believe so. I don't think so, LSSU. I think that your acronym needs, you need a different easily pr uh, pronounced easily said acronym LSSU it just doesn't it doesn't have Riz <laughs> we need to hack it oh goodness wait for it that's cringeworthy yeah. <laughs> I can't think of what's else but I'll just... <laughs> at the end of the day it's certainly not fetch and I'm outie So the next article is over in the continuity report. The most underrated fantasy TV show of the last 10 years could still get a sequel. I hope so. I actually started watching this series. It hasn't, doesn't even say what it is in this article. Uh, I mean, in the snippet, but we'll talk about it here in a second. Um, I, I dug a movie that it's kind of, that is based off of, uh, well, the books, uh, the, the, I dug the movie that the books are based off. God damn it. I love the movie that it's, that is based off of books. You know what? I'm just going to turn this bus around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes I hate this job. So fantasy TV shows have been incredibly popular in the past 10 to 15 years, but one in particular was rather underrated. According to this author, it's over at Screen Rant. And James Hunt says his Dark Materials is an underrated fantasy TV show that didn't receive as much attention as it deserved. The show had solid reviews, but it struggled to stand out in a crowded fantasy genre. Genre despite its lack of mainstream popularity, there's still hope for a sequel based on other books in the series and interest in those involved. I dig the world building of his dark materials. Um, I think, uh, I'm going to end up getting all of these books. Uh, I believe that there's audio book versions of them and I think I'm going to get the whole thing. Um, if I can. So, Let's see if I can suss out some of this here. So it had three seasons. Um, Lyra and Will. So Lyra is the one of the key ingredients here in this series, um, as is Will. But what's really neat about the world building is that you have a familiar that is the embodiment of your soul. And... You are, animal. I'm sorry. 
AKA an animal. An animal. Um, and if it dies, well, in the movie, they create a, a mechanism that shears the familiar from the person. And without that soul um, being connected, you basically become a different person. You mean in the TV show? Yeah. In the, no, no, no. It's a movie. This is the TV show version of it. Oh, okay. Um, so what's really neat about it is the world building. I just, I dig it. So it says uh, why his dark materials and his extremely underrated uh, fantasy TV show. And they go into some detail about the stats. Uh, it's a brilliant example of all the wonder, awe, and love the genre can inspire. His dark materials wasn't critically panned by any means, but it wasn't lavished with praise either. It flew under the radar as a movie, and I think as a series, it flies under the radar as well. It's like definitely like a low B, high C kind of a rating. Um, the the beginning of the of the uh, the Golden Compass is the movie. Right. And I, I actually loved the golden compass. Oh, I did too, but I was not a big fan of his dark materials. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't even know those were the same story. Yep. Um, so I really dig I the world. The building. visual and everything of his dark materials. I just couldn't seem to get real connected to something about it. Yeah. So in the golden compass, I think that um, there were some really, I, I don't recall anything not commanding your attention, but it wasn't hyperkinetic either. Um, it wasn't boring as hell either. So and it wrote a fine line, but I think that it didn't really draw people in because it's, it was being, um, the writing for the books, um, I think are fundamentally different than what people want to read today. And so converting it into the movie, I think was an exercise. That's why the golden compass, I don't think really got anybody's attention. And I don't think that there was really that much, um, attention for his dark materials as a book series either. So, um, so it says his dark materials was pulling in just around 150,000 viewers on HBO. Um, it says a uniformly superb cast and, uh, then says has powerful themes around faith and religion that unlike the movie, it does not shy away from, but at its heart, this is a coming of age story about friendship and love and the show's emotional beats land beautifully, uh, fantasy, uh, fantasy shows have seen the wheels come off their story struggling with pacing or uh, failed to develop characters. His dark materials did a great job across all three seasons of building a cohesive whole, but the satisfying payoffs are just about everyone. So will they get another sequel? Don't know. Although his dark material season three was the last one having adapted each book in Pullman's trilogy. There is still a way for the show and certainly uh, Daphne Keene's Lyra. Um, could get a sequel. Pullman has written several other novels and novellas within the universe, three of which do pick up Lyra's story from the events of his dark materials, Lyra Oxford, uh, Serpentine and the secret Commonwealth. There's some serious world building in this. And, uh, I, I, I dig the idea of these demons, um, being the souls, the, the, the embodiment of the character of the, uh, you know, the, the person. Um, and I like them mythos behind it so um i think i will all end up um uh picking these up and listening to them i don't know if i really um got wrapped up in the show because i watched a couple of the episodes um but i don't think that i really got wrapped up in the show so uh end up going back i'm sure and uh, checking it all out I don't know. Maybe if I binge it, then everything will be cool. You know? Yeah, maybe that's the way to do it. No downtime waiting for something to show up. So that's just how I am, I guess. Nowadays, the drip, drip, drip just annoys me. Okay. You want to move on to the next article? Sure. 
Uh, this next article is over in Gnometown Daily. I thought this one was hilarious. So, uh, what'd you do for Christmas? Oh, I stole a driveway. A Florida woman discovered her driveway was stolen while preparing for Christmas. Florida How do mother. You even steal a driveway. I don't understand it. Stolen in broad daylight. How does that happen? Florida mother Amanda Brochu said her driveway was stolen earlier this month. Brochu's real estate agent told uh, Business Insider, and this is where it's sourced from. She believed Brochu was a victim of a scam. Brochu set up a GoFundMe page that raised more than $13,000. A Florida woman was attempting to sell her home. Said her driveway was stolen in broad daylight. So let's go over to Business Insider. Lauren Edmonds is the author over at Business Insider for this article. This is just a Getty image. This isn't actually her driveway being stolen. <laughs> Uh, how does this work? Okay. Let's see how this works. She was attempting to sell her home, said her driveway was stolen. She posted her story in a now disabled GoFundMe page created on Thursday. According to brochure, the incident uh, occurred in December when her fam this is December when her family listed their current Orlando area house for sale with hopes of moving into their forever home. Oh no. Brochu told the outlet that she was that she confronted one of the contractors who claimed a man named Andre hired them to determine the price for a replacement driveway. Unsolicited contractors arrived to measure her driveway. The outlet reported that the contractor showed Brochu text messages from Andre that contained his initial request and her home address. But Andre was out of town when the contractor asked to meet in person and cut off communication when asked for proof of ownership. After the cops spoke to them, they called me back and they said that it was a mistake. He just got the address wrong. Nothing else will happen again or nothing else will happen again. Okay. A weird turn of phrase, right? It's not just me. Right. One week later, Brochu got a notification from her ring doorbell camera that a showed a bulldozer tearing up her driveway and taking it away. Wait a minute. That might actually be right. <laughs> I know, but it says Getty images. But... Yeah, it's a Getty image. Um, so is that the image? Nope, that's a Getty image too. So yeah, Roshi said when the police officers arrived at her home, the company that was tearing up the driveway had already completed the job and left the driveway with only dirt. This is a bit strange. Mm -mm. They had multiple people come forward saying that they've seen like things like this happen, whether it be driveways, roofs, painting, even outside the exterior, e even outside the exterior. So it happens more often than we actually see it more often. Wait, even outside the exterior. Is that like uh, not inside the uh, the environment, but outside the environment? Not <laughs> unlike the interior. <laughs> ah, that hurts my brain. So unwavering support from the community. They've uh, had a GoFundMe that raised $13,000. She recently replaced the home's roof and made a separate investment. So she didn't have the $10,000 needed to replace the concrete. No one's going to buy this. This brings down the property now. And that just messes it up for me and my family. Maybe she re really needed a, uh, a new driveway. And all of this is a conspiracy to get $13,000 from a GoFundMe. You know? Yeah, but who paid the contractor to remove it? Well, I mean, it's weird, right? Cox everything Media Group radio sponsor. Weird. Huh? Everything about it is weird. It doesn't make any sense. Like, who's getting a benefit out of this? I don't, well, she's getting a new driveway for free. And she's donating the $13,543 she raised on GoFundMe to a local nonprofit in coordination with Nine Family Connection. That's nice. You know, it could have been like the mayoral mansion's uh, driveway that was 
shoddily put together and it's basically going to be a peeing for distance contest to get the money back. All right. Anyway, let's keep going. Please, nobody steal my driveway. I like my driveway. Uh, the next article is over in the continuity report. Reacher season three update is great news for fans of Lee Child's books. So I'm a big fan of Reacher. I like to reach for things all the time. <laughs> Here's a drink. Uh, there's my chapstick. Look. Ah. Some new updates surrounding Reacher season three. This dude is built like a cinder block building. Yeah, I was going to say like a wall. If he were to hug you and like really bear hug you, you could split in two. Anyway, Lee Child's books. So I suspect that what makes Reacher so easy easy to absorb into your world as entertainment is that the writing in the books are spectacular and really all you're doing is diluting it with screenwriting effort <laughs> so uh, i mean unless you're a horrible screenwriter it's going to be hard to you know screw it up in lee child's and, and or Whoever it is who is distributing the rights is going to be all over this. That's true. I mean, I think a lot of times TV shows or movies that are based on really good writing, like originally books, it shows. Yeah. Uh, 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 the cop, what's the one? He's military and he goes, he becomes a police officer. Now it's legacy. Um, Oh, like Bosch. Born Identity Trilogy, or although it's actually a quadrilogy, I think. No, uh, Robert Bosch. Ludlum is the writer. No, no, Bosch. Oh, Bosch. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Michael Connolly is the author of the books. Yeah. And then the, the other one, um, the, the Lay something. Damn it. Oh, Le Carre. Le Carre, yeah. Um, just excellent writing. So you you basically have to fall asleep at your word processor computer nowadays um, to really jack that up. So anyway, Amazon Prime Video is where Reacher is. Uh, watching Reacher season two right now. It's a fun watch. Go, 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 right? Uh, even the boring parts actually just give you downtime to recover your energy so that you can be prepared for the next scene that's going to be exciting. The bikers just showed up, got wrecked. It's funny. They told me you were going to be armed. Did they tell you you were going to die tonight? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, that was a fun scene. So you never mess with the special investigators. That's the that's message right, for the, the show. Of season two, I think. Yeah. Uh, Daruv Sharma over at Screen Rant put this article together. Um, do they? Yeah. Okay. So the deck statement says a new Reacher season three update is great news for fans of Lee Child's books because it offers some promising insights into the show's future seasons. 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 Hmm. Okay. So we're in season two, right? That's right. All right. So uh, suggest fans of Lee Child's books will be pleased with so show's future story developments. Uh, they received rave reviews from viewers and critics. Although many successful shows dip in quality after the opening season, Reacher has maintained its streak by breaking in positive critical reviews, even for season two. I think it's pretty, uh, it's pr pretty, pretty amazing right now um let's see it's hard for fans of the original novels to not appreciate how accurately the show portrays jack reacher's adventures um i haven't read the books have you read any of the books no i have not 
Um, seems kind of up your alley. Um, but I, is he that starchy? You know, like Reacher is pretty. I don't know. I don't know. It. Have to read the books. You know, uh, he's portrayed kind of as a guy who walks with his arms straight, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to describe it any other way, but they're just like locked at the elbow kind of thing. Um, and, and kind of a, a fire plug, you know, he's just like blunk. Uh, when, if he were to sit in a mini, it would swell in all dimensions, right? This guy is just really big. Um, great guy though. I mean, seems really great. Reacher season three, uh, update promises more classic Reacher stories. Now the way that this is broken out, it seems like it's multiple articles ticked together, you know, uh, Reacher season two skipped nine books from the original Lee child, Jack Reacher book series by adapting bad wow. luck and trouble. Dear God, nine. <laughs> that must mean there's plenty available past that. <laughs> All right. This established or they're that picking they out the, the highlights. I don't know. It's not the exact chronological order of the books. Well, let's see. We made it to 717 before no shit news. Although Alan Richardson has opened up about all potential ways of the Amazon series could progress. Most details surrounding season three are still under the under wraps, under the wraps, under wraps, even though it has been confirmed. Fortunately, some new updates surrounding season promise more classic creature stories. Seems like it's going to be a blast. So the only thing is that it's a stretch. Come on. They drop a pipe bomb for crying out loud. Eliminate six people and no cops show up. Well, right. Which, but, but previously, like the moments that they were going into this house, there were, uh, uh, sirens going there. Like before they even walked up to the house, true. the sirens were going. Cause you even commented on it, you know, Hey, what's, why are sirens going nonstop? And I said, it's New York. Hmm. Anyway, um, let's see what else they say. Amazon series may have bright future after season three. Reacher will only get better with time. I mean, if there's a ton of books again, I don't know about the full length of the Reacher series, but it looks like there's at least nine books. <laughs> wait, 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 they jumped nine books. So there's at least 11 books. The season one book or season one is based off of a book. Season two is based off of a book, nine books later. So it looks like there are 35 books. Okay. So it's a series that I'm never going to pick up because I'll die before I finish them because <laughs> I listen to audiobooks. I don't, Oh, this just makes me want to talk about the inner voice, inner monologue. This is, this is really making me want to talk about the inner monologue. I guess I have to wait for semiotic ontology. Anyway, by not deviating far from the books, Amazon's reacher will also likely remain in the good books of both viewers and critics, further improving the odds of its future success and potential expansion. That's the key ingredient. The books are amazing to the point where it elicited 30 books because fans love the character and the writing is spectacular because if it was shitty writing, nobody would have allowed that book series to grow to 30. I mean, Take this show, for instance, everybody loves it to the point where we have two seasons, 365 episodes per season. If it was shitty production and lacked personality, nobody would like this show. It wouldn't exist, you know? Anyway, go tell a friend, everybody. Maybe we can have, uh, like on continuity report, we can have uh, show dates, uh, 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 watch dates. You know, we just well, set it up. Fun. Mm. I'll make it work. Okay, let's go. Last article for the year, folks. Last article for the year. Hold on to your butts. 
No pressure uh, on this article. And by that, I mean the, the word but. Like, don't say but this, but that. Everything after the but is a mistake. 2023 was a decade-defining year for game releases, but so brutal for the industry, it's hard to imagine another one like it happening for a long time. But guess what, folks? Don't underestimate artificial intelligence. Uh, the author of this article, it's over at PC Gamer, by the way. So uh, the author and a lot of people who like games tend to break the hobby into legendary years. It's one of those when so many games come out that it's almost impossible to keep up with them. And in hindsight, you can observe some kind of watershed moment of quality and innovation. Larry and Studios, I'm looking at you. That's actually not part of that quote, but yeah, Baldur's Gate 3 set a trend that I don't think anybody's going to be able to live up to. Uh, here, this is the last article for our show. I'm throwing it into the chat. There you go. Ted Litchfield is the author. Was 2023 good for the world? No. For the industry, also no. But the games themselves, boy, did they rule. And of course, they uh, have a screenshot from Baldur's Gate. So 1998 is... that was probably the most known one, right? From 2023. Yeah. Um, And if not Baldur's Gate, then cyberpunk uh, releasing its stuff. So it says here, 1998 is understandably always in these conversations. It's almost absurd that Metal Gear Solid, Ocarina of Time, Baldur's Gate, uh, Half-Life, Thief, The Dark Project, Starcraft, oh my God, all came out in that year. 2004 is a big one too. Half-Life 2, Halo, Metal Gear Solid 3, Vampire the Masquerade, Bloodlines, which the author... Again, Ted Litchfield refers to as my sweet baby released within a few weeks of each other. And uh, they can also personally attest 2007 is a great year to have an Xbox 360 uh, and be allowed to play M rated games for the first time. (laughs) M is mature. So 2023 can absolutely be part of that canon now with a deluge of... uh, Amazing games from indie to triple A level. The dam seeming to burst on all of the COVID delayed projects that uh, they'd been hearing about for a minute. So Baldur's Gate 3, Armored Core 6, which actually seemed to me to be a flash in the pan. But maybe that's just me. So Golden Parachute. So they say the problem doesn't seem like it's going anywhere either. Ever since the PlayStation 2 generation or so, uh, high-level development has increased in cost with diminishing returns for graphical and gameplay innovation. Basically, they're talking about the high cost going through the roof. But so much can be done. the consumer gamer doesn't see the result of it. Uh, Correct. Yeah. Um, Whenever I end up talking about the business mechanics of any business, um, those who are running the business see one side of it employees see another side of it i see every aspect of it um in in my problem has shifted my observable problem has shifted from there are high risk high reward scenarios and then there's greedy bastards that are making millions of dollars and calling other people entitled when the business ultimately fails because they have to hit these high profit margins. Um, and they basically, the, the mantra is got mine, screw you. Um, and that has disturbed me. I, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I, I got out of a, a certain industry because I hated backroom deals and, where people were treated as chattel and cast aside when profits weren't right and the runway was getting shortened. Um, Even though all that needed to be done was tighten the belt and lower expectations and profits, you know, returns on investment and so on. Um, But you don't get billionaires by treating everybody as equals 
you have to step on next. So um, it just kind of pissed me off. The gaming industry seems to have started going down that road to the point where developers, individual small time indie, indie developers are now capable of pumping out some pretty amazing games and becoming millionaires um, off of their own hard work and dedication. They have to take the risk and they might have to work long hours after their daily grind. Um, but the tools are there for a lot of people. You won't build um, a massive story like Baldur's Gate 3 uh, off of nothing more than one person's hard work. They had hundreds of people doing work. Um, but I think that the profits need to be distributed better to the developers the, the the people that are actually grinding away long hours like the actual programmers and the actual engineers um and uh you know it needs to scale on the level of the work that goes into it the number of hours that are dedicated to the job um evaluated by somebody that is a little bit less uh well somebody who's more impartial to the progress of the project um and not looking at the bottom line going, well, I need to make X. Otherwise the investors will be angry with me. No, make a great product and tell the investors, this is what you invested in. You know, we hope that you'll get your return, your expected return rate of return on investment, but it may not happen. I don't know. Um, it says insomniac Spider-Man two went 30 million over its initial $270 million budget with a total investment three times what was spent on the original PS4 Spider-Man. These are like triple A big budget. Is three times the investment in Spider-Man 2 evident to anyone who plays the game? I don't know. It depends on who you talk to. If they don't have a lot of experience in gaming, they're going to say that. Yeah, you know, um, I I was watching um, a game recently that uh, with my subject matter expert in the same room looking at an intro uh, a trailer to a game uh, i was just astonished by the level of particle effects that were being distributed uh, displayed on the screen i'm like that this cannot be live gameplay sure enough the game says this was all live in-game play and then i was told you know the new spider-man does the same level of particle effects okay now I got to go and find that game again and look to see how big the development budget is for it. Because if it's $300 million, my God, I, I just don't see how anybody can afford to make games anymore. Like actually make the games. Right. Because you're going to have to charge, you know, $80 for a game and hope that your story and production value is superior to, well, this show. Um, so they talk about golden parachute, right? That ends up, th this is the thing that really pisses me off, right? Hasbro, it's unclear how many of those 1900 layoffs at Hasbro were at wizards of the coast, which just happened right before Christmas, 1100 people, 800 previously earlier at the same year, saw a banner year for dungeons and dragons, notwithstanding the OGL. Because they're the idiots that tried to talk about greedy bastards. It's the same thing with um, uh, the uh, Unity thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, where well, a, a person. Reddit thing too. I'm sorry. Oh, and Reddit, the Reddit as well. Thing too. But that's blown over. It seems everybody has basically just said, "Okay," and and they called it. You'll you'll be back, right? You know what? It's like the the guy who breaks up with his girlfriend and she's like, he'll be back. And sure enough, you know, he comes crawling back. I'm so sorry. I had a great man. That's what that happened with Reddit. Everybody's like, you, you, you're a horrible person. And, and Reddit's like, you'll be back. You little big baby. Come on back. I'll take you back. I accept you, dumbass. So Dungeons and Dragons, you know, well, we don't know how many at Hasbro was 
Yep. Booted right before Christmas. It was like 10 days before Christmas, 11 that days or something like that. Horrible time to do a layoff. I mean, it's just a shit move. It, it absolutely is a shit move. Yeah. But the people are going to make money. Um, I think they got a $3 million bonus or something like that. Is is that the rumor that I heard? Let me see if it even says it in there. Epic Games, 830 layoffs. Similar feel, surreal to look at it. Uh, 11.8 million? Is that what that dude ended up with? Oh, that's the Unity person. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pointing out that John uh, Resatiello's $11.8 million in compensation for 2023 is a moral outrage in the face of Unity's Nearly 1,200 laid off employees almost feels passe, like slapping a fuck cancer sticker on your bumper. Yeah. It's just, it's sociopathic. You don't deserve $11.8 million in compensation in 2023 when you fire nearly 1,200 people. But the you know charge them with a task make them do development make the product better i was told though that unity's doing just fine yeah um and this was like a side discussion that i heard between other people talking about unity um from the industry so i don't know um and I don't really know those people, so I, I, I can't say that it's absolutely nothing more than opinion. Um, so anyway, so what do you even do about it? One bright spot in the industry side is that Larian Studios well deserve success with Baldur's Gate, just as Bloomberg Jason uh, Schreier pointed out in August. This isn't this isn't easily replicable. Um, while the gaming giant Tencent has a 30% stake in the company, Larian is privately owned by uh, Sven uh, Vinke. I'm not sure how to pronounce that name. And his wife with Vinke uh, also taking on a director role in the developer's uh, games. That leads to a rare consolidated control of the company and its projects independent from stock price and shareholder demands. See, that's the thing. If you have m maybe this is the only way that it can work because there isn't a demand for an ever massive profit and then ongoing discussion about how do we you know scratch out ever increasing 10 percent every quarter or 20 percent every quarter right but on the other hand it's hard for companies to compete at least at a certain level yeah with those that are like that Yep. I don't know. I, I I suspect that 2024 is going to be the era of independent developers with powerful stories um, and not these massive AAA games. Although World of Warcraft is sinting at a massive expansion of old school story driven adventures um, and it's already started. I want to play it, but I don't want to lose myself like I've done in the past. I mean, uh, from I had to stop playing World of Warcraft because I was playing it for like eight to 12 hours plus a day um, while trying to do my MBA. It's just not something that it's an untenable position. Um, so uh, what they mentioned in this article at the very end is if there's a bright spot to be found, it's in the continuing trend of industry unionization. But I hate to break it to you. A company doesn't exist just because there's a union. So if the product right, the company sucks, still go under. Yeah. Or and get bought out. Yeah. So what I suspect is going to end up happening is subsidiaries of the mega corporation is going to spin up with the sole purpose to pump out that one game. And if it shits the bed, they disband and the union goes bye bye, even if it does form a union. On the other side of this is if that kind of stuff happens, the first move would be y'all are a union. We're giving you the opportunity to buy the assets. 
Now it's owner operator controlled, right? <clears throat> like a lot of businesses, they have skin in the game. They're dedicated to the cause. They all do their own marketing. It's a passion project for each individual person. Otherwise they're unemployed. They find out the real process of running a software development company. Um, so uh, unions exist, but not when the enterprise itself shuts down. And I'm, I guarantee you there's already a way that they're going to be able to have a parent company, a whole bunch of subsidiaries that are designed specifically to build that one piece of software. And, you know, let's say, uh, I don't know. I don't know which game, whatever Baldur's the game Gate is. Four. Yeah, Baldur's Gate 4 spins up. Its only objective is that. It doesn't pan I know that out. might not be a good example because it'll probably succeed. But. It'll be yeah, it'll be amazing. <laughs> Particularly if Larian does the same thing. But it's entirely owned by <laughs> two people, man. And a passion project. All right. Anyway. We'll see what happens. 2024 is right around the corner, just a few hours away. So here's to 2024, everybody. See you in the new year. Uh, let's get back into the party bus so that we can get down to Main Street and the welcome sign and um, say farewell to 2024 and uh, hometown dailies. 2020, what? The 2023. Oh, farewell to 2023 and uh welcome in uh 2024 and say bye 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 i'm Merwat. that's hometown.com i'm gonna stop rambling and riffing and up there is the sentient ai that keeps me out of trouble even though i just flubbed good night hometown citizens happy new year and we'll see you in 2024 bye bye everybody <laughs>